So you have seen the introduction given previously with Op DJ. But for the people living under the rock, you have been the TEDx speaker, event manager, and everything that I want to become in life. I when I saw you for the first time in our orientation, I saw this is the man I want to become. So for for the people living under the rock, could you just say who who DJ is, who Deepak Justin is? Okay, I think you already said it all. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing much more to add. Uh, but I could just start by saying I started my career in advertising. I moved from advertising towards another form of communication and expression, which is corporate training. And uh, I used to just brand uh, commodities. I mm-hmm. went about promote branding human beings. So I would probably say I went about transforming products when I was in advertising. I went about transforming human beings. So the difference was between inanimate objects towards uh, living beings. Probably that's a transition that I made. So I think the two things that uh, define my life one is creativity and other is communication. Creativity and communication, two amazing things to have. So. Uh, we are speaking uh, during your days in advertising you pr- advertise products with better storytelling your products were selling getting sold more and the same do you do with humans like you transform them every single session you go you your ch- your motor is transformation True. from the day one to the day end you see a tremendous transformation True. so could you just tell how could you do that and how your storytelling benefits the person in front of you and the person you are branding also like you brand yourself through storytelling you tell your your life story you tell your friends life story that is how you project and communicate your ideas to the world so could you just tell me more about how storytelling is what makes an effective storyteller and why deepak justin is deepak justin through storytelling okay yes five questions <laughs> let me yes. try to track down all the questions <laughs> okay fine so uh, why is storytelling so important i think probably yes. that is the first yes. question so bill grow the founder of uh, the founder president of uh, national speakers association he says that uh, every form of presentation or every form of public speaking should have a story and it should make a point mm-hmm. you know so i guess uh, we are all in the form of in the business of communication presentation so an effective presentation should have a good story and should make a point and uh, what makes an effective story yes everybody tells a story a good story is the one that connects with an audience and i think that is one thing that really uh, differentiates a good story from probably not so good story and uh, what makes me a special storyteller i am a story collector you know all my life like and i've been collecting stories not only my own but also the stories of other people so when i sit with people i ask tell them what is your greatest story what is your finest story what is your life defining story what is your life transformational story so i ask them these questions and when they float around these stories i ask them the question can i quote this in public So I think that something that makes a difference it's not something that I subsist with my own stories and sometimes I use the fabric of my own imagination to create stories that did not exist. So uh, and I tell them very clearly this is a story of my imagination. I should remember I was a very shy child and I wrote this particular uh, this piece of literature if I were to call it for my uh, school magazine and it was all about uh, a swallow a bird the swallow which actually flies it falls and it breaks its wings and it tries to fly again but it falls so i wrote in a poetic interlude and uh, in that i just go about telling us how we are all like the swallow you know somewhere like you know we break our wings and we struggle whether and we are have the self doubt as to whether we can fly back again and uh, the story ends with that particular line which says like you know will the swallow swallow its pride or and uh, eat the worms on the ground or will it resurrect its broken wings and learn to fly again so years later i created that into a real story and i gave it in the form of a speech so uh, that story is not true and the reason i selected a swallow or a sparrow or a crow is because of this one line will the swallow swallow its pride right. so it had a poetic uh, touch towards it so i guess like you know collecting all these stories you know is something that made me who i am and i personally believe that uh, you start collecting stories you'll be an impressive speaker yourself okay start collecting stories let us start collecting by dj's inspirational story dj's life changing story what what is that one story that defines okay today i am because of that moment i lived in my life okay i'll probably say uh, there were too many stories that happened in my life okay. i think it's very difficult <laughs> for me to um, fix on one and say that yeah mm-hmm. this is the one story that made a difference to me in life like i don't know there are too many things that happen at different stations of my life i think too many things that happen and that is something that made me different so i find it really difficult for me to hold the, on to one isn't there a one story that you would tell the world okay this 
is my story. Okay, uh, I'll probably say that the one story that I probably hold close to my heart is the fact that you know I was told that I was a person who could never stand on stage and speak. Okay. You know, as a child, I was told that you know he's too mild as a speaker, he's too soft as a speaker, he's too uh, mellow as a speaker, as a as a communicator. I used to sit in the last row, the last but one row, because of my height. And uh, when a teacher used to ask me for a question, I used to respond, and the response was never even heard by the teacher. So invariably, I think I used to lo lose out a lot. And uh, I think when uh, I got into my school group and I said that uh, I am today a communicator by profession, most people say DJ can speak. You know, that's the kind of question that they were actually asking me. So I'd probably say that is one story. So my the point I was trying to make and I would want to make to anybody who's listening to this particular podcast or witnessing this is this if I can do it, anybody can. Now my hashtag is this anybody can. <laughs> it's a very proud moment just saying that prove you wrong. Yes. I will feel cheap thrills actually. Yeah. <laughs> say that you know someone rejected you and someone rejected and now you are what they're pretty much good, yeah. Mm. So storytelling, collect stories. And what through oration, like you could tell great stories through writing, through oration, through videos. There are Charlie Champlin told stories without telling a single word. He he just had his final speech. That was the only th time he spoke on TV. So what made Charlie Champlin a better storyteller? Because he just spoke through his moments. And body language is one of the key 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 ingredients for better communication. So how was he able to communicate to the world his way of comedy, his way of inspiration? Could you just shed some light on that? Okay, see, Charlie Chaplin was a genius. He was able to make people laugh at a time when they were going through a recession. Yes, yes. And uh, he made people laugh at themselves, and I think that was his greatness. He never made fun of the rich, he never made fun of the, yeah, his last film, I mean, I think the great he, dictator, he great was his last yes. film. I think uh, he actually made fun of a particular political leader mm -hmm. in a very satirical form. But uh, most of the times he made people to look at their own problems and to look at it in a lighter way. I think one of his greatest, greatest quotations was this. He said, a life is a comedy in a long shot and it's a tragedy in a close-up shot. So I guess that's a way he was able to look at life. And I think his genius lay in the fact that uh, he would probably put himself in the victim position and yet not be victimized. You know, so I guess that was his genius. And uh, back in the day, I think the form of comedy that they had was more like burlesque. Mm. Burlesque is too much of action comedy. And it's not situational comedy. It is not a, a dialogue-driven mm. comedy. It is not like a Woody Allen comedy where it's written the narrative is what's the one to drive the script. No, his was more of the action comedy. So I think uh, people of his times were more, uh, I mean, more or less thriving on that genre of uh, comedy. So he was quite successful and most importantly, I think he made people to think, to think about their plight, he was able to entertain them, you know, despite the fact that things were not pretty much good on their uh, side. Charlie Chaplin was indeed great. The clock scene was actually amazing. Oh, that that was amazing. That, genius, yeah. that was something different. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. have been an event manager. You have written stories. You advertise this brand. You are a personal. You personally be, personally brand yourself. You change mm -hmm. leaders. So there are around hundreds and hundreds of people around the world who just want to get into this industry and be a, a life changer or transformational leader. So how does one go about that? Is it through better story or is it through having a great, 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 great background great background that, okay, I have done this, I climb Mount Everest or can a common man do that? Yeah, I think everybody's got a story, everybody's got a, I mean, the basic magic in them. And I would say that, you know, the first thing you need to realize is what do you want to become? Mm -hmm. Do you want to be an event manager? Do you want to be a speaker? Do you want to be a motivational speaker? Do you want to be a corporate trainer? Do you want to be a personal coach? Do you want to be a keynote speaker? Like, you know, I think if that is first of all, like, you know, mm -hmm. identified, then you need to focus on how you can get there. You know, how can you get better in that same craft? You, know, you keep working on it, probably you can hire a personal coach. You can join certain movements that facilitate your communication process or your communication drive. And after that, you start experimenting low, like, you know, you just look at the low-hanging fruits. And after that, you get into the big stage. Because the big stage is unforgiving. You know, mm -hmm. if you try to speak in front of 5,000 people and fear to fall, obviously, I don't think you're going to get your second chance. And one of the things I learned in motivational speaking is this. When you finish a motivational talk, it is not the standing ovation that actually defines who you are. It is not the number of compliments that you get from the audience that really defines who, how great a motivational speaker you are. 
But when a couple of people call you back and they say we want another gig with you, that is when you define yourself as a motivational speaker. And likewise for corporate training also. But for an event manager it is quite different. Some events happen once in a lifetime. Mm-hmm. If you are an event manager for a marriage, I cannot expect uh, probably my camera person to get married three times, four <laughs> times to call me back for another gig. That's been ridiculous. You know? So I think the metrics are quite different for different things. Mm-hmm. So, uh, okay, I think people may refer you for another thing. But I think it may never happen again. Yeah. So, okay, so you're telling just find one thing that you want to be great at yeah. and pursue it. Yeah, for example, I know this one friend of mine, like, and he's a motivational speaker. And he does motivational speeches and keynote addresses only for sales uh, you mm-hmm. know, summits. And I think most organizations have their sales uh, summits at the end of a year, at the end of the financial years. So he goes over there and he tells them as to how they can set their targets, as to how they can go about making their entire drive to meeting their targets much better. So he sticks to that. He's written a book also on the subject. Like, you know, so I think he's going to be so, successful. So if you have pretty much a focus on something, I guess like, you, know, you could be uh, thriving okay. in that space. A very specialized role, you would say. But what, are, what about jack of all trades? I would say that you need to be a genius for that. You need to be a genius for that. Like, and I think some people are there. Mm-hmm. Some people are really there. Like, you know, who could do multiple things. Like, you know, I mean, Charlie Chaplin, like Charlie you Charlie. mentioned, like, you know, the man could actually direct. He could write a story. He could act. He could make another person act. He could probably do multiple things at the same time. Like, and he could mm-hmm. dance. He could do a choreograph, a scene. Like, and he could do everything. Like, you know, so I guess the man was a genius. You know, so some people are uh, gifted with that. Or one of my role models in life, uh, uh, Bruce Dickinson, the lead singer of uh, Iron Maiden. Mm-hmm. The guy is a lyricist, he's a singer, he's a rock star, he's an entrepreneur, a motivational speaker, a certified pilot, a uh, uh, yeah. person who gives lectures on history and uh, literature, a serial entrepreneur, a series of things. Like, you know, so he could do multiple things, jack of all trades, and he's master of some also. Mm-hmm. And uh, for some people, like you know, like us, like you know, we are sometimes jack of all trades and masters of business administration. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. So uh, you're telling it's better to be a jack of all trades, but no, I would say be uh, multifaceted, multi-skilled. Multi-skilled. I would say that you know because uh, one of the motivation speakers, Jim Rohn, said, in the 21st century, don't be caught napping with one skill. You know, you could get washed out, AI could replace you. So uh, these days, when AI is taking over, is it improving your writing? Do you use AI first of all? I didn't use it for certain things, not for everything. <laughs> uh, for example, now you used to write speeches, you write, used to write scripts. Does AI do a better job in it? Because you have seen so many scripts in your life, you have seen so many team keynote speakers speak their scripts. So do you think, is it yet there? I would say AI, as of now, doesn't replace creative thinking. Mm-hmm. You know, it is actually a pattern recognition tool. And a pattern recognition tool cannot be creative. When I said, like, you know, creativity defines my existence, you know. So I want to be something which emanates from myself, you mm-hmm. know. It tries to show an extension of my persona. So when I look at a speech, like, you know, yes, like, you know, AI helps me with regard to the data that has to be synthesized. You know, if I'm probably giving a speech on a particular subject, like, you know, if I want to do a research on that, and if I want to get XYZ's opinion on that, a group's opinion on that, mm-hmm. the research data to be called out, Yes, I use AI for that, like, you know, but I think when it comes to the actual presentation of that particular data, I use my own creativity. That's great, actually. Yeah. But will AI replace things? Because if, if it has access to thousands and thousands of scripts all across the world, Swami Vivekananda, APG Abdul Kam, their best scripts out there, of their speeches, will it be able to recognize a pattern out of all those best speakers and create one great script of life? See, the like problem that. is this, like, and I mean, it's like telling that, okay, yeah. fine, like, you have wonderful eyes, um, she's got wonderful uh, teeth, and uh, he's got uh, excellent uh, hair. Put it all together, he doesn't make a human being who's perfect. You get a distorted image of a person. Yes. You know, so I guess, like, you know, personally for me, like, and I believe that uh, uh, the human intelligence still cannot be replaced, and the human creativity cannot be replaced or displaced that very easily. Because when you're looking at it eventually, like, you know, you'll see that uh, there is a touch which is personal. There's a story that happened in my life. Mm-hmm. And when I speak about that particular story, it comes out with a passion that I'm becoming, which I think AI cannot. AI can give me a story of someone else, you know, about this particular story. When a cashier's play tells a story about a cycle being stolen, and he has to replace his identity and becomes a moment early in order to clog the dream realize of the person in a boxing ring. It's a story that he speaks with so much of passion because it happened in his life. 
and ai no matter how strong a story it provides for him that story can never be replaced mm-hmm. so i guess like you know so certain stories like mm-hmm. come from the depth of our existence and the lessons that we learn from those stories come from again our reflections of what happened to us and that is something that makes it very personal and when an audience can relate to those stories like you know that's what makes it very great you know and otherwise i think like you, know, you may end up with uh, boring stories from other people and you don't give your personal stories mm-hmm. and ai doesn't know when i was tell the ai like you know okay why don't you write a story about me <laughs> ai will do nothing he doesn't know what my story is or it True. does not know what my story is yes okay so you have never was it by your birth that you were like an amazing speaker like you told you were not so i was very shy on the contrary i was actually the reverse <laughs> so yeah. how what was that transformational journey for you like how did you go about it was it a personal challenge that you want to See, be the better child i uh-huh. was a very introverted child and like most introverted child like you know, i mean children mm-hmm. i should journal a lot mm-hmm. i should journal a lot i should write stupid stuff like dear journey dear <laughs> yeah. diary you know today i went to my this boy called vikya and vikya i should want to tell him i should write all that mm-hmm. it is be stupid like you know i mean i think uh, uh, my dad every year used to give me a diary a physical diary you know things became digital but no like my mother always used to tell me what's wrong with you like why do you buy my diary you don't know my son that's what you used to tell her like you know so uh, i used to write and i still like writing so my starting point my first dot was actually writing you know as a form of expression so i used to write a lot and something that you keep doing over a period of time like you know you find the sources mm-hmm. that are really profound like you know and my dad had a good library you know so i used to read works of all then emerson and uh, i mean people like uh, john keats and uh, milton and stuff like that novels you know? not novels but works of literature you works know of, uh, so i guess like you know so that had a deep impact on me like and some things which i did not understand you know i used to sit and have a dialogue with my dad and some of the conversation that i have like i truly treasure them because i guess uh, he was actually an ma literature and he actually motivated me to study ma literature after my graduation i did that out of sheer joy and uh, out of the sheer uh, you know interest in the subject you know so writing is something that truly fascinated me and that started of the whole journey mm-hmm. and uh, most of my first speeches were actually extensions of my own writings and some of them appeared less conversational they appeared more literary you know most people would comment saying that okay this is a very very uh, written uh, piece of uh, mm-hmm. you know communication this is not appropriate for uh, a person to read it out you know so later i realized i had to change my style of speaking you know, that's how my journey began so you started off by writing your writing and expressing yourself through Correct. pen and paper through the written word yeah yes okay then now let's get to the next segment i just wanted to ask are you born with crea- this just straight forward question are you born with create are you born creative or do you be creative i believe everybody is born creative i strongly hold that children are the most creative people and they i think are. we all grew up from mm-hmm. childhood to becoming adults and as of course you are a god so like i said you stole people are born creative so like everything creativity ha- does it have a structure or is it just out so there people try to find their own method for the madness mm-hmm. <laughs> everybody has their own method there is no single formula mm-hmm. i mean look at quentin tarantino like i mean he has his own method I mean, there's a movie in which uh, he kills Adolf Hitler, mm. and uh, Adolf Hitler dies in an auditorium in one of his movies. In another movie, I think there are two characters who are actually dead. Mm. You know, and uh, the last scene they just walk out, a non-linear style of storytelling. So people have their own uh, styles of uh, creative expressing their creativity. But what if a person says, "Okay, I'm not creative. I do not. I'm not that genius." So what would you say to them, like? how do they unlock that potential of them so it's a mental block according to me mm-hmm. it's a mental block and everybody is creative in some way like there are different dimensions of creativity i'd say like some people are verbally creative some people are pictorially creative some people are mathematically creative some people are spatially creative like you know so i guess they have different dimensions of creativity so the point is for you to unlock mm-hmm. which form you know mm-hmm. i still remember chemistry she said taught me taught me about uh, valence electrons in a very uh, creative fashion and she spoke about something which i could connect so very easily to this very day i can uh, relate that particular uh, chapter that she had actually taught me and that person was my mother you know because uh, i was really struggling with that particular chapter and she taught me that in a very creative fashion like and i said oh in chemistry can be taught in a very creative fashion hmm. so everybody has their niche everybody has their own way of expressing yeah. hmm. so 
ओके ना मेन गोल ऑब्जेक्टिव फॉर दिस इज टू नो मोर अबाउट स्टोरी टेलिंग स्टोरी टेलिंग इट्स सेल्फ इज एन इंटरेस्टिंग सब्जेक्ट बिकॉज एनी थिंग कैन बी मेड इंटरेस्टिंग एनी एनी पीस ऑफ लिटरेचर कैन बी मेड इंटरेस्टिंग बट हाउ डू वी गो अबाउट इट देर आर सर्टन स्टेप फॉर एग्जाम्पल इफ आई वुड टेल यू मेक दिस चेयर इंटरेस्टिंग हाउ वुड यू डू इट हाउ वुड यू मेक इट इंटरेस्टिंग chair is not a story the a uh, story around the chair okay see there are basic components as far as the story is mm-hmm. concerned like you know see the thing is uh, you need a conflict mm-hmm. you know see i would say that you know a cat sat on a mat is mm-hmm. not a story it's a statement mm-hmm. a cat sat on a dog's mat now that's a conflict in mm-hmm. statement because you're wondering what happened to the cat i mean was the dog attacked by the and if you're talking about a christopher nolan style of storytelling he would probably say the cat sat on a dog's mat which was beaten by his master who lost his job because he was questioned for his integrity uh, and uh, he could be arrested so you have layers and layers of conflict mm. you know and that is easier for a storyteller to build into a rising uh, dramatic action so and i think that is where like and i think christopher nolan as a storyteller really excels you know he puts too many like you know a conflicting points mm-hmm. like you know for the protagonist to debate about or to confront so if you are to talk about this particular chair you would say that okay fine like you know uh, my grandfather actually sat on this particular chair and he died mm-hmm. his ghost is still sitting in the chair and it's just staring at me and in the night if someone sits on it they get thrown up they get get thrown apart okay and uh, Incidentally, my grandmother died because she sat on this particular chair on his birthday, and he got to live it. You can build on anything. You can build on any which is just a stupid chair, you know. And this chair was probably built one month ago. <laughs> okay, even way before my grandfather was even, yes. you know, uh, died or passed on. So I guess you can build on it any which way. So if you want to make a funny this thing, you can say like, you know, what if this chair had a a voice? Mm. If it would actually start talking. it could talk about a person who sat on this particular chair and uh, swung across and the weight of the thoughts were actually imbibed by some kind of osmosis you know you can build on it all you have to do in order to make it realistic is slip in some scientific terms like osmosis and think by it <laughs> so and the chair can actually read it could be an amazing chair can read so the chair can read a person who ever sat on it it can actually echo their thoughts so it's like a light detector it's like whatever you know So it's wired with AI. Chat GPT chat. Yeah. So you can make up any story that you want. Great, great, great. So now, what what makes an amazing story is conflict. There is some layers and layers. I saw Christopher Nolan's storytelling style. He has a conflict. He solves it. There is another conflict. Then that is a circle. There is a circle by itself. The protagonist finds a conflict. He finds a resolution for it. Then there is another. During the path of his re- resolution, there is another conflict. There is another smaller conflict. That makes a great story because that is something we are looking forward to. How how will the protagonist save his save save himself or save the world? So that is one conflict in superhero movie. Super uh, Superman is that one part of it. So now, when you say a great story, there is many, many, many factors. You fumble sometimes. You forget what the protagonist is even there. You forget how to deliver it in a particular way. You forget the pauses. So to build a great story, do you have to recite it in your own mind, or do you have a pen and paper? Like, I'm. If, for an example, if you would explain it to a five-year-old child, how would you explain how to tell a great story in his school or in his kindergarten? How would you tell that? Okay. See, it's not just conflict alone that makes a good story. It's interesting characters also. Mm-hmm. You know, so I saw a movie, an Indian movie, regional movie, like you know, where a character is struck by a lightning and he gets superpowers. You know, and uh, he realizes that okay, fine, he's a superhero, and he realizes the lightning had struck another person at the same time. So there's a protagonist and antagonist that's created mm-hmm. with the same superpower. You know, so it is an interesting, it's an interesting plot and an interesting characters, interesting two characters that are created. One is evil, and other is uh, you know good. So it is created. So, so I think uh, it's not necessarily just the conflict alone. It's a like you know creating interesting characters. It is writing interesting dialogues. Some people are very good at dialogues. You know? So I think if you can probably write brilliant dialogues, and uh, which create that, which makes the plot to advance, and uh, your plot points with twists. You know something that happens which is a twist, like you didn't expect it to happen. You know if I were to catch this particular, uh, uh, what do you say, like you know, this train and go to this. a particular place and if i attend the interview and clear the interview yes i get a job 
Now what if it doesn't happen? I miss the particular bu- uh, train and if I don't go, then the story takes a different twist or a different direction. So you actually think about the possibilities. Now I had the fortune of meeting this uh, legendary storyteller called uh, Jeffrey Archer. And Jeffrey Archer was asked this question. I mean, he was there in the gallery. I didn't meet him one on one, but I was there in the gallery that met him. Like, and uh, he was asked this question, okay, how do you know who is in, in a suspense novel? How do you know who is the, the culprit, the perpetrator? And he said, till the last chapter, even I don't know. Because if I don't know, if I know, I would lead my audience in some way by leaving them cues. But even I don't know, so at the last chapter, I think and I try to decide as to who could be the possible uh, uh, perpetrator of the entire uh, commotion that's taken place. Yeah. So, and I thought that was great. You know, so I guess like, you know, so if you have everything wired and over here. So when you're starting off, you're starting off with a blank slate. And as you keep writing, like, and I think it takes different dimensions. I think it happens even for a speech. When I start off with the speech, yes, and the tyranny of staring at the blank page is something that truly really, like, you know, offends you. But as you carry on, like, you, know, you know for a fact, like, okay, this is one way you can take it. And experience teaches you, like, you know, okay, fine, this has been done before, let me try something else. So mm-hmm. you go ahead. Okay, DJ, I do not know what more to ask you. I have answered all my questions. So is there something you want to tell the world this about life or something? Something deep. Something DJ. Nothing. There's nothing deep in the world that is deep. <laughs> Besides the ocean, there's nothing deep. Okay, if you really want to think about something which is deep, like, you know, okay, fine. Um, relegate yourself to solitude. Okay. And reflect yourself silently. You may get something which is deep. But I think... Uh, Life is something which is interesting both at the deep end and at the shallow end. You can enjoy yourself in both the places. So all I'd say is you have one life, live it to the fullest, respect the process, enjoy life and most importantly be happy, keep smiling. Because uh, I met a beautiful lady, she's my wife and uh, she had this lovely life. Uh, There's nothing more precious than the smile on your face. Don't lose it for anyone or anything. That's probably the deepest message I've got from my life. Yeah, DJ. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vikas. You've been a wonderful host. Oh my God. Let me show you what I...